Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kate Weigel and I'm an AmeriCorps service member with the Utah Conservation Corps. I'm serving at Utah State University Extension Moab in the Permaculture Initiative, which is one of the sponsors of this event. So I'm facilitating tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, our event is sponsored by USU Extension Permaculture, which provides teaching, research, and outreach on permaculture design through the Extension Sustainability. We have two permaculture gardens, one in Logan and one in Moab, uh, which is the city that we're broadcasting from tonight. So welcome from wherever you are in the world. This program is also sponsored by Moab's Resiliency Hub, which has the mission to inspire resilience in Moab community through dynamic learning, open conversations, and stewardship of creative initiatives that rethink, retrofit, and regenerate our community. And finally, it's also sponsored by Community Rebuilds, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to build energy efficient housing, provide education on sustainability, and improve the housing conditions of the workforce through an affordable program. So tonight we're joined by Reed Saunders and Jessica Manderfield of Community Rebuilds. So Reed spent a year and a half coordinating the Living Building Challenge with Community Rebuilds before joining the on-site build team as an apprentice and newly a project manager. And um, Jess Manderfield has been developing her career in natural building with Community Rebuilds since joining us, joining as an intern in the spring of 2014. She's built homes in Moab, Crested Butte, and was the assistant supervisor for the bunkhouse builds of Community Rebuilds. And um, Jess has actually left Community Rebuilds now, but is still joining us this evening for the talk since she was instrumental in doing the Living Building Challenge. And this is also a topic that's particularly dear to my heart um, because I also worked on these buildings that you're looking at right now. I was an intern um, for five months helping to build these buildings in the Living Building Challenge. So I love uh, getting to facilitate all these webinars, but this one in particular is really exciting for me to help share with you guys. So with that said, um, I'll pass it off to Reed and Jessica. We're gonna have a poll towards the end. Um, once we go into kind of a question and answer session, that's gonna help us with our impact reporting. So if you don't mind answering that poll, that would be really great. I'm going to put links to all of the organizations I just mentioned in the comments. You can feel free to put questions in the chat as we go through um, and either I'll jump in with them or we'll get to them at the end um, during the question and answer. So yeah, with that said, take it away. Thanks for joining us, guys. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. We're going to talk about our experience doing the Living Building Challenge. Oh, how does Bye. this work? Um, <laughs> just had to figure that one out. <laughs> um, so as Kate said, um, Reed is newly project manager, um, and I am a former program director of Community Rebuilds. Uh, we, uh, as an overall organization, um, have always prided ourselves on building energy efficient homes um, and natural homes. Um, it is a straw bill uh, natural building program. So we educate interns. Um, at this point now, we usually run a, a 16 person crew of interns with uh, staff, with apprentices um, and assistant builders and builders. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to come learn anything about building. It's a great opportunity to learn natural building. Um, and so we'll, we'll have people who have been in general construction and want to learn the natural side of things. We'll have people who have never swung a hammer and want to learn how to take better care of a home they may buy in the future. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a really unique program. Um, and we've always been uh, trying to be sustainable. So when uh, our founder, Emily Niehaus, was at a conference, I believe, she heard about the Living Building Challenge and was like, we're going to do this. Like, we've already, she's like, we've got this. Like, we, we have so many of the things already um, that it was then a, a matter of figuring out the rest of it. Um, and so we partnered with um, Arch Nexus, um, which is an architectural firm, and we have engineers that we've always worked with, and we went for it. And so this is, yeah, our challenges, and because um, it's called the Living Building Challenge for a reason. So even though we already had quite a bit of 
the steps in place, there was still so much to learn and so much to benefit from doing this. So, yeah. Um, cool. So what is the living building challenge? Um, the easiest way to think of it is as a building certification for sustainable buildings. However, it is so much more than that. Um, and the International Living Future Institute, which we'll call ILFI, they're the ones that created the Living Building Challenge and have many other certification programs. Um, their intention with this is more as an advocacy and philosophy tool to change the way that we're thinking about um, the world that we live in and how we make it and um, how we advocate for a better future. Um, so these are all just, I'm gonna, I have a lot of slides with a lot of text and I'm not necessarily gonna read that text. It's just for your information, um, but we're gonna kind of talk around it and talk about our experiences with it. Um, anyway, so in ILFI's words, the Living Building Challenge um, wants to change the paradigm and the paradigm from doing less harm um, to one where we are a steward and co-creator of a living future. Um, and this is a graph from their standard of the Living Building Challenge that we really like um, to show people as a way to envision how what this paradigm shift really means. Um, basically, ILFI is saying sustainability is not enough anymore. Um, we want to have a positive impact. We want to go from neutral to positive. Um, and that's really what this whole certification system um, and philosophy and advocacy tool is all about. So with that, we're going to go through all the pedals. Um, we'll try not to talk too much, but we'll try to explain it and yeah. also talk about our experience with it. <laughs> cool. So first pedal is the place pedal. Yeah. Um, and as Reed said, there's lots of information to all of these pedals. Um, so feel free to read what's on the slide. We're going to give you kind of very brief overview of these pedals. Um, as well as kind of our experience with them um, in doing our project. Uh, so uh, the place pedal um, is something that uh, basically for us as community rebuilds, uh, we have a small landscaping budget. We live, we're located in the desert. Um, and so in terms of, uh, you know, doing a full-fledged landscaping on our houses. It's not something we typically do. A lot of our homeowners and what we promote is a zero scape aspect. So we, you know, if they want to plant fruit trees or shrubs, we kind of have a budget for that. Um, and then we, we definitely want to promote more of a, a zero scape in the sense of don't use all this water <laughs> in the desert. Um, just have like what you need. Um, and so uh, with the place, um, that's kind of been one of the challenges um, with the living building challenge for us is that they require urban ag agriculture, um, which many of our homeowners do want to have a garden of some sort. Um, and so a certain percentage of the land um, for your project does need to be dedicated to growing food, which is great. Um, I think a lot of people with COVID kind of really got back into that this year um, and brought back like legacy gardens and things like that. Um, so uh, it's definitely, I think more in the minds of people about growing their food and learning how to do that or relearning how to do that because they haven't been doing it for a while. Um, and so it's great that this is a requirement um, for us. Our homeowners do um, want to do that and we encourage it but we've never really had a setup for maybe watering it or mm -hmm. um, doing it in a sustainable way they've always just hooked up a hose with potable water um and then uh in terms of um we'll get into the water part later <laughs> because that's a whole nother thing <laughs> um and then just what we're doing with the ecology of place um, is they're trying to make sure that you don't go in some place and bulldoze it all down and then never restore or bring it back to what it originally was. Um, you also can't build in specific areas. So you can't build 
um, in floodplains or like wetlands and things like that. They want to preserve those and leave those alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, ecology of place um, is also uh, proving to be quite challenging um, because again, we live in the desert. Uh, and so to get any sort of restoration back um, to what that land may have looked like, uh, it, you know, the desert, it's just a seed falls and if it gets lucky and it might rain shortly <laughs> after that, it might root and it might live and it'll grow out of the crack of a rock and it looks beautiful and great, but that's just a by chance mm -hmm. thing that happens and uh, there were thousands of other of those seeds that did not make it. And so for, for this project, that's one thing that um, they're taking on right now is like, how do we bring our site back to um, what it looked like before we came along? Right. Um, and how do we do that with a, a low water factor? Um, and so that's, yeah, that's a challenge that we're still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah and then yeah there's this really fascinating like just a saying like conflict between having urban agriculture and trying to do some sort of like restoration in a desert environment and so and our lot is where we're doing this project is half an acre and so it's it's really constricted but it's also like super fascinating to be thinking through these things and um making plans for them so we're kind of those plans are developing a little bit organically since we are so constructed and since we do want homeowner feedback on you know what their landscapes look like right um but it has been great to to dive further into like what a good landscape for <laughs> our houses looks like because yeah. we never yeah had to really do landscaping yeah. before um and another big thing with the place pedal is habitat exchange so they do um want you to set uh or basically give money to a land trust or um, there's there's multiple options, but one of them is to uh, set aside an area equal to what your project size is to be protected. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's usually done through a land trust. ILFI has their own um, land trust that you can donate to, um, but there's other wetlands and other type places that you could give to so that um, you're kind of making that exchange and even though you built here, you can support another area to be protected. So, yeah. Um, so after the place pedal, we have the water pedal, and we jumped in a little hot. I <laughs> realized as we started talking about the place pedal, basically this this certification is broken down into seven pedals with twenty imperatives that are broken up into those pedals. Um, and the reason that they're pedals is that part of the whole philosophy is that a building should have the same impact on its environment as a flower does. So it should be responsible and net positive with water. It should, it should be compatible with its place. It should be beautiful. So anyways, that is just a little background on the structure of this. Um, so the water pedal has been one of the most challenging for us. Um, in 4.0, which changed from the last standard that they had, they kind of update how this program works um, every once in a while based on feedback from project teams, um, which has been incredibly helpful for us in switching to 4.0. We started the project under the 3.1 certification. Um, but the main thing under the water pedal that we're grappling with is net positive water. And what that means is that they want your building to you like provide 100% of its water needs and address all of the black water, gray water, and storm water on site. Um, another factor is not using potable water for non-potable uses. Um, so there's a whole bunch of exceptions around this. Um, in order to do this, it would be you'd have to have some really sophisticated infrastructure um which is wonderful for like a big building i think but for us and having four small single family homes that can't share infrastructure just legally um that would be incredibly expensive and challenging um so they have exceptions to be able to use your municipal um municipal water um part of that comes out of 
federal drinking laws that are really hard to get around. Um, a lot of times if you live in a city, you kind of have to use um, that city's um, municipal water and sewer. Um, and recently they just changed some of their rules about black water and gray water, um, specifically in ways that benefit affordable housing projects. Um, so we, our project is part of their affordable housing pilot program. Um, and as such, we get to take advantage of some of these allowances to use our sewer system or to, they call it handprint, handprint um, some of the water that we send to the sewer. Um, which basically means like in future projects, we still employ the same water efficiencies as we did on these projects in order to like make up for what we are sending to the sewer. Um, and so basically the most exciting thing about this is that we have some of the first permitted residential composting toilets in Utah, I guess the first legally permitted. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of incredible that um, composting toilets haven't been legal in one of the driest states in the United States. Um, and we are super excited to have gotten to advocate for that. So um, the, fir the first two of these, ha of, there's four total houses. The first two um, have composting toilets. Um, they have gray water systems. We also had an experimental permit to send our kitchen water to gray water, um, which in Utah, anything in your kitchen is normally considered black water, but um, we were trying out a system, turns out it was a ton of maintenance and through the updates of 4.0, we're allowed to like kind of alleviate our homeowners of um, a system that wasn't really working well for them, um, which is really awesome of ILFI to kind of, um, sort of make this system a little bit more possible for different types of projects like ours, which are more constrained by budget or time or resources and all of that. Um, so yeah, it, it's been, like Jess said, we, we've helped to get gray water into the state of Utah, um, but we never fully, we, we plumbed to have gray water in our houses, but we never installed a system ourselves. And so to have this um, certification saying like, nope, you got to do it. You got to install the system. You got to um, sort of plant around it, make sure it's like doing what it needs to be doing. Um, it's been a huge point of growth and we're really happy to kind of add that into our um, set of skills and into our resources that we can offer homeowners. Um, yeah, I think water is probably one of the biggest puddles uh, we feel that ILFI pushed us on and has changed us for the better mm -hmm. in the sense of, um, you know, as long as the homeowner's budgets can afford it, um, we will be uh, having outdoor water tanks on mm -hmm. all of our houses now for water collection so that hopefully they don't have to use potable water um, most of the year to water any of the gardens or the plants that they want, that they can actually collect it throughout the year and use the tank water to mm -hmm. water their gardens. Um, obviously for these ILFI pro or these living building projects, um, it's a requirement that they don't use potable water, um, uh, that they use the water that we're catching um, <clears throat> to water their agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, they also use rainwater to flush toilets because that's another example of using non-potable water for a non-potable um, purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's one that has been funny that's kind of been in the community rebuilds conversation. It's like, oh, why are we like using the bathroom into drinking water? This is insane. And so again, we have like a reason to, <laughs> to change that and to yeah. see what it looks like and see if it's, it's feasible for future projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also feel free if you guys need to ask questions. I don't know. We're, there's a lot yeah. of information, a lot of stuff. So let us know. All right. Moving on from water to energy. Um, energy pedal is something, um, one of the things that I think uh, Community Rebuilds was doing well already. Um, we, uh, when we started looking into the Living Building Challenge, um, 
we've been putting solar on our home since 2015. Um, <clears throat> and it kind of depended on the budget of the house, um, but for the most part, they had fairly decent sized systems. Uh, and a lot of our homeowners were actually achieving uh, net zero or net positive. Um, and so that's the cool thing about uh, living building challenges that it's, you might notice that they're, they're not just saying net zero, um, they want net positive mm -hmm. um, energy, they want net positive water. Um, and so for the, uh, energy pedal uh, they want you must supply 105 percent um, of the project's energy needs uh, through on-site renewable energy so what we use in the desert are solar panels um, we at the beginning of this project actually had a house uh, qualify as a net energy certification um, which was really awesome uh, that house was one of many on our list that probably would have qualified, um, but we just got the one certified. Um, and so the other thing that we've been doing as well since also 2015, I guess it was 2015 <laughs> that we made that change, uh, is that we're, uh, we don't use combustibles, so we don't use gas. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we strictly use uh, electric appliances, um, water heaters, things like that. Um, and so that's a requirement for LBC because um, they want you to reduce uh, that carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have a, a carbon offset as well when you're building these houses. So you have to calculate <clears throat> how much embodied um, carbon like materials are in your house. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to uh, pay for that carbon to offset that carbon. Um, so for us, we build this straw and it's actually carbon sequestrian, um, which is, you know, something that our founders always been super proud of. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of, uh, farmers will, will actually just burn their straw in the field. Um, and so that's obviously just putting carbon into the air. <laughs> um, so it's awesome that, uh, we are, we put that into our walls and it makes a great insulation. Um, it will actually help lower our carbon footprint of the houses. Um, we have to get, which will be talked about a little bit more in the material list, but uh, something called FSC wood. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, a sustainably forested wood product um, that is also gonna help uh, lower our carbon uh, footprint um, because it is also sequestrian. Um, and then as much as possible, we've always tried to do local um, mm -hmm. and our clays and our soils that we put on our walls um, are locally sourced. Um, so the fact that they're not coming from far away and that they're basically the dirt outside our door um, is gonna help with us that as well. So, um, <clears throat> and one thing that we have been noticing, uh, we haven't <laughs> touched upon it yet, but uh, there is a performance period with Living Build and Challenge. So you don't just set these houses up um and say okay we, we did all these things and it we can we can move on way. we'll walk away yeah. it will it'll perform how it's supposed to perform they actually test you and they want to know that it's performing in the way it's supposed to perform um so for the energy um you have to track that and you have to know that these homeowners are living within their renewable energy source um which uh, COVID has obviously changed a lot of our lives. <laughs> um, and it is really changing our um, living building challenge uh, certification like <laughs> process because we have homeowners who are now working from home all the time. They also, you know, maybe they, they just had a, a kid. So they have a, a parent in helping them also living with them. Um, so there's all these changes where we're like, Oh geez, like we didn't, we size these systems good, but at the same time we didn't size them for them to be home 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be using the water, uh, to flush the toilet 24 seven and to, yeah. So we're definitely running into, um, some pretty interesting stats on our energy, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, data, um, and trying to figure out how do we, uh, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I do, I, our, our performance is 
is going well but it is one of those things where you're like oh man that's cutting it close that wasn't supposed to be that way um luckily we're since we're doing four houses they can perform together and if one is high in energy another and another is low they can be balanced they can offset each other which is great but that is part of the program Mm -hmm. um and you know if we were individually just doing a home then that one house yeah would it would be hard yeah for sure I have a question from a participant asking what kind of composting toilets we're using. We are using a composting toilet called the Phoenix composting toilet. <laughs> uh, it is made in Oregon by a man named Glenn. It's made in Montana. Oh, Montana. <laughs> Whitefish, Montana. <laughs> Something else was from Oregon that I just <laughs> got mixed up with. She, oh, all the woods from Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's from Montana, um, and they're really groovy. We have some photos later of the composting toilet. It's a gigantic blue yeah. box. It's bigger than you think. It is, <laughs> and it is hooked up to a vacuum flush toilet that sucks the waste into the composter. You throw some wood chips in there. It's got a big old crank, and you crank it. Um, but yeah, you'll see the images later on. Um, it's a pretty big system, and it's it's cool because it it almost streamlines this technology. It's mm-hmm. not like the, I don't know, composting toilets where you're just like, it's just a bucket with wood right. chips. It's, it, you're using what feels like a normal toilet and there's, right. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, moving on from energy to the health and happiness pedal. Um, Health and happiness has a lot to do with the interior environment. Um, You can't smoke in living buildings. You can't smoke near openings of living buildings. Um, They have us, we'll talk about materials next, but you have to vet materials for certain things. And one of them is if it is an interior product that it must um, comply with VOC standards for the California Department of Public Health. Um, So California, has some of the strictest standards on VOCs, um, which is volatile organic compounds. Um, And that's kind of a classification of chemicals that is in a material and can off gas. Um, And so- Basically anytime you paint and you smell that stuff or anytime you stain something, the smell coming off of it is the VOC. Right. And so California has had like some of the worst time with them poor air quality due to VOCs and therefore they have stricter standards which we comply with um, with any product or material that we're using on the interior of the building envelope. Um, And part of this is also that during the performance period we have to get the indoor air quality of our homes tested. Um, That is something that we are still figuring out um, and really interested to see um, how it works out. Um, The indoor air quality testing is kind of interesting for different places um, because when you have, when you're in a city or something that has worse air quality, sometimes opening the windows and sort of these little habits that we might think would help our air quality um, doesn't really work. And in Moab, we kind of, we're starting to, experience inversion a little more extreme than before. There's smoke, which doesn't typically happen that I know of. I haven't been here as long as you, but it's not something that we're normally seeing. And so we're like, oh shoot, our (laughs) our air performance outside is kind of different now. And what does that mean for our um, interior environments? Um, And another part of health and happiness um, is to connect, give people access to nature Um, and so all the windows must be operable which is kind of a no-brainer for a residential situation but when it comes to larger and different types of buildings um, pursuing this certification that's kind of a big deal it's not something that is normally thought of Um, and it also wants a lot of connection with nature and um, sunlight you gotta have some sunlight and um, greenery around. Um, Yeah, that's the gist of health and happiness. 
Um, and then materials. Woohoo! Materials is the <laughs> hardest one. And I say that because it affects my life the most. <laughs> um, so the biggest part of materials is called the red list. Um, and ILFI has created um, a red list of chemical classes, which are, um, they have determined to be the worst in class chemicals. Um, and so it's things as mundane as PVC that you're like, oh man, that's around and that's toxic. I had no idea. Um, or there's like kind of no brainers on that list, like mercury and lead. Um, there's things like formaldehyde, which you then, as you're doing the red list process, you find out that it's in everything, everything. and it's pretty unsettling. <laughs> um, so uh, the requirement for this is that 90% um, of new materials coming into your building have to be vetted um, to avoid red list chemicals. There's a whole slew of exceptions that happen around this that make it not impossible. Um, there are situations where we have to use PVC because of our building code um, or uh, maybe something we're just not able to source a red list free um, product in a quantity that we need. There's kind of, there's all sorts of um, exceptions because it's really hard. And the intent with the red list imperative is that you're finding out 100% of the ingredients in any given product. Um, and Which you think would be easy, but it's not. we've had people who wouldn't even <laughs> tell us the name of their company who made the product. Right. It was proprietary. The name <laughs> of the actual like company was proprietary. Yeah. So if you can't even get the name of the company. Or you're like trying, <laughs> it's just hard to find the right person to talk to. <laughs> We're like, yeah. you're talking to someone that's in like customer service and you're like, do you have like a technical department? Do you have anything? And they're like, I wouldn't even know who to ask <laughs> about what this is made out of. And it's like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> anyways, it's a, it's a really difficult um, requirement. We have a huge tracking table um, that lists out all the materials. And that huge, but it's determined. not because our building is actually so right. small. I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to do like a commercial building, the list is endless right. and daunting. Yeah, and we're super, super fortunate in the fact that we do natural building and affordable housing because um, number one, natural materials are super easy to vet. Straw is straw, <laughs> it is what it is. It comes from Colorado, <laughs> love it. Like it, yeah. that's, it, yeah, it's okay in a VOC standpoint, you don't have to worry about it. Um, and also you don't have to red list vet um, salvaged products. And so we've really heavily relied on um, salvage materials, which then again helps our affordability, and is something that I personally, as someone that worked in like restoration, really love about this project. Where you have really cool doors and like cool little features of um, salvaged products, and a lot of that was me also making my job a little easier and not having to vet right. <laughs> something else or like have to spend a lot of money on a new red list free version of it. Um, so the other two aspects of the materials pedal is living economy sourcing. Um, this one has been really interesting for us where they want to see 20% of your materials by cost coming from within 500 kilometers, another 30% from 1,000 kilometers, another 25% from within 5,000 kilometers, which is basically on continent, and then the remaining 25% of building materials can come from anywhere in the world. Um, and so it's interesting because a lot of ours comes from that 20%, the smallest bracket that we have to fill. We have so many materials. And again, that's our reliance on salvage materials and um, natural materials showing up in a really um, positive way. And both of those, since they're inexpensive, they let you account either count double the cost or add in labor, depending on what it is. Um, and so I was kind of at first, like a little bit worried about this because in this rural setting, we're kind of, there's not our, a lot of product. Yeah. Our hands are kind of tied in certain ways 
with where things are coming from. Um, or it like creates a big reliance in ordering online instead of at our local stores. And that has been an interesting um, part of this. Right, like Reid said earlier, the, the product that came out of Oregon was actually our entire framing package. Right. So it was all of our lumber because there was no, nowhere closer to actually source FSC wood. Right. Um, and so. And then our local hardware store, which we're trying to have a good relationship <laughs> with, is like, what? what? Why didn't you buy from us? Yeah. <laughs> it well, didn't help that. FSC pamphlets didn't help that they had to come help us offload it with the forklift. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah. so uh yeah <laughs> um but it, uh, anyways um it's also fortunate that within that 500 kilometers for us includes uh salt lake city and denver mm -hmm. um and there's a fair number of materials that come from of high cost materials that come from within our range so our, our big line items like roofing and um windows and our trusses got assembled in colorado and so those um larger things as well as like all the almost all the natural materials came from within that so it's like oh yeah. cool it's just a couple of random things from the rest of these bubbles um so that's living economy sourcing and then the last aspect of the materials pedal is net positive waste um, and again this is a really interesting use of saying it's not neutral it's positive um, which is, seems a little confusing when it comes to waste but basically what this is saying is that um, you need to divert um, nearly all of your um, built project waste from the landfill it needs to be recycled or reused or um, diverted in some other way and the rates are different for different categories of materials but it ranges from 90 percent to 100 percent diversion depending on the type of waste um, and part of net positive waste is that you have to use salvage materials within your building um, and that's kind of what makes it positive is they're saying like you are, you're keeping landfill. more out of the landfill than what you're putting into the landfill um, so this is, it's been a hard one for us because we can't, we don't have a great way to measure waste in They don't weigh, town. they don't the weigh lab. dumpsters. And so there's, wasn't like a good way. <laughs> they just go off of the size. Yeah. And, the <laughs> and so our, our colleague, Brittany Valine, who has been helping a lot with um, the materials pedal of this project, she was like, all right, we're doing a hundred percent diversion of everything. And so, We've gotten super creative yeah. on how we reuse waste. And it's really been really exciting to see all the creative different um, uses. And it definitely relates back to permaculture where you're like, oh, we have this, this need for a wall on the corner because it's so loud and we need to present information on it. And then it's like, oh, what if we built that out of trash blocks and all these really creative things. So we'll, I'll go a little bit more into that later, but Net positive waste has definitely been um, a point of growth for us as well. The whole material pedal has. It's been so challenging and we've learned a lot from it. Um, we made sure the interns were uh, leave no tra leave no trace. So it was pack it in, pack it out. Right. Don't Not leave your trash your from your lunch, there. your yeah. coffee cups. <laughs> we don't want to have to take care of more trash than, right. than we already have to. Yeah. <laughs> There, at the end of the builds, we had a uh, really fun competition where we s tried to figure out who could stuff the most trash inside a uh, wood glue bottle. <laughs> so who could get the heaviest wood glue bottle? There's a great photo of us all standing with our wood glue bottles full of trash that are eventually going to be made into bricks. <laughs> so, yeah, so that is the materials pedal. It's definitely one of the most uh time consuming. time consuming yeah as as challenging as um water and energy and everything else can be the materials pedal is like a it takes for us it was a lot of yeah. staff time compared to anything else and it, it you have to be super cautious on site where it's like oh my god where did that come from we can't use that <laughs> who and, brought that on here yeah it also means like oh, i'm doing all the store runs and i'm like I, no i'm gonna go yeah, and get the right thing off. yeah we actually ran into our 
some of the apprentices and staff would run into the homeowners at the hardware sometimes and be like, what are you doing? What are you buying? <laughs> what are you buying? <laughs> no, you can't buy that. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Moving. Oh, I this wanted to list. include this. This is the red <laughs> list. This is all of the um, different chemical classes. So there's many chemicals under each of these things. Um, but it's kind of like the the category, essentially, of chemicals that are on the red list. Um, so I just wanted to show that. All right, moving on to equity. Equity. Um, so this one is kind of all about like universal access. Uh, they want to make sure that um, you know, it's ADA accessible. We, we've tried to make sure our, most of our homes are ADA accessible. Um, people here in Moab are very active and heaven forbid something happens, mm -hmm. but they should be able to still use the home that they built. Mm -hmm. um, so we do try and, and do that um, in general. Um, but this, like for a commercial building or a larger uh, structure, you can kind of think of it as, you know, uh, the wheelchair access needs to be just as prominent as the stairs. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to make it very clear as to how people can enter and come in um and you want it accessible to all um it also has a really cool component where uh <clears throat> living building challenge can be parks as well um, but you also have like outdoor areas outside of large commercial buildings um, and they make it so that you can't um kind of put obstacles in the way um so kind of think of the cities and how a lot of benches are not able to be slept on um yeah they're intentionally designed intentionally made so that people homeless them, so. cannot sleep on it um and so uh they have this uh cool rule of universal access where it's like no like if you know if it's a bench you're not gonna put things in the way like rails and make it individual seats on every bench um it's you know if someone's gonna sleep there someone's gonna sleep there mm -hmm. um so that's really cool um, and then, uh, there's rules of, um, basically you cannot build your structure or your house or something, uh, in the way of someone else's house. So you can't take away someone's sunlight. If they build passive solar, which all of our houses are passive solar, you have to make sure that the house next to it on the south side is far enough away that it will not interfere with the sunlight coming into the windows and warming up the house. Um, goes the same thing for natural waterways. Um, you can't block access to these things. Everyone should have access to the natural waterways, the sunlight, uh, fresh air. Um, and then uh, for inclusion, um, this was a really cool one. Um, I thought so just mm -hmm. I was more in the office uh, during these projects um, but uh, you have to have two just label organizations um, on your project um, luckily one of our partners Arch Nexus they were already just labeled um, and we decided to make community rebuilds uh, go through the process of a just label um, and it's basically a food nutrition label for your business. I mm -hmm. feel like that's like one of the best ways to describe it <laughs> um, is it, it creates a labeling system of like, um, you know, how uh, diverse are you? How, whether that's, uh, you know, do you have females running or at higher up in your offices or, you know, do you have an equal kind of mix of people? Um, do you, uh, what are your, policies and procedures we went through our entire all of our policies and procedures and kind of uh just went through the list and was like okay like what can we improve on what can we do um you know do you offer benefits to your employees um do you i don't know what are there's so many like. there's so many and we definitely <laughs> our like program improved from it where yeah. our executive director did not want to see low points on any category and so she's right. like all right we're making this change <laughs> we're offering this you know yeah. we all have Roth now. IRAs yeah, yeah. All have IRAs <laughs> and like um so it was stuff that we had you know done 
uh, to a certain extent and they had looked at and had been improving upon, but the just label just really made you sit down and look at um, all these factors about your company mm -hmm. or your business. And so it was, it was a great kind of look into what we were doing mm -hmm. and how we could improve. Um, it would be great for every organization yeah. to like be forced to sit down and look at it and go like, oh, like we can't fill in a box here. Like, right. what do we do? Can we, can we change this? There's mm -hmm. going to be some, uh, some of the stuff like there just might not even be a way for them to improve upon depending on what the industry is that they are in. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part, everyone should be able to increase their, their box fill-ins with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, we should have put a label on, but we didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of the equity. Right. Um, they made changes to the um, inclusion oh, yeah. uh, imperative recently with 4.0 that are pretty cool, where they want you to involve a workforce development program and have more diverse stakeholders. So basically, they want of the project team to see women-owned, veteran-owned, or minority-owned um businesses or run businesses and um it's been cool because we for both of these we're already like check okay don't have to <laughs> change too much um but yeah ilfi and, and community rebuilds we have like a pretty good relationship and i remember them like asking to kind of highlight us as a case study and like mm -hmm. inclusion so that was that yeah. felt like a nice pat on the back for us yeah <laughs> Um, all right, last pedal is the beauty pedal. Um, the two imperatives are beauty and biophilia and education inspiration. Um, for those of you who have never heard this term, biophilia um, is a pretty interesting field. It means um, basically the love of life and has to do with the innate connection between human and nature basically saying like humans need humans need nature around um and what are ways that we as designers and builders can what how can we include nature in um indoor life and in everyday life and so um at the beginning of the project they want you to sit down and make a a, a biophilia plan that's based on this whole workshop that you do with your stakeholders and um ours was quite a while ago now but it definitely has informed our design and has um, made us more thoughtful about things and um yeah it's been pretty cool and it's been cool to like being on the build side and being like wow this is this really is me like biophilia like wow i'm putting like mud on the walls and like <laughs> there's like tree like trees at the corner of these houses um and another part of beauty is that these places have to be beautiful. There has to be um, sort of art that is only there for the purpose of human enjoyment. Um, Which is our whole house. <laughs> you, the you art of the plaster. You can't use that. It's the art Actually, of the plaster. Maybe plaster like the yeah. account. That would totally count. The homeowner plastered their own wall. You're, you're right. You're right. <laughs> 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 there's a thing where they're like you can't say that your building is beautiful, beautiful. enough to, <laughs> to count this anyways um yeah it's a it's a it's a cool requirement um and then the last one is education inspiration and that has to do with providing educational resources on um the project and how it's going and um they want you to have annual open days. And so this is one, a lot of the ones we've gone through applied differently to single family home, where it's like, you don't have to create public space on, on people's your private, on residence. private yeah. residence, or like you don't have to have an annual open day to somebody's house. And so we just have to do one um, open day and have case study published. So yeah. But at CR, we usually request tours of all of our homes from mm -hmm. our homeowners throughout the years yeah. so they'll their house will be seen yeah <laughs> yeah there's something i really like about this pedal that this whole system is so well-rounded and thoughtful about everything that happens in design mm -hmm. after the building is built and how it gets lived in and how it continues to affect a place around it it's like you can't just do lbc and like keep it secret and not talk about it and be like oh 
this is a cool thing we did. <laughs> Jess, we're never sharing it with anyone. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they, yeah, I, I think it's a cool um, pedal. Sweet. So now we're going to talk uh, a little bit more in depth, just checking the time, um, about our, go a little bit deeper into our experience with the Living Building Challenge. Um, to kind of back up a little bit, this project started become, coming into the works of fall of 2018, mm -hmm. um, which is about when I started with Community Rebuilds. Um, that was when we started designing the project. Um, it's on the corner of Mill Creek and Mill Creek, which is formerly where our bunkhouse was. Um, we demolished that bunk, well, we deconstructed that bunkhouse. We saved everything. And we, that, used, and we used all it. of it. Yeah. <laughs> we needed a little bit more, we, actually. We did. <laughs> we could have used some more rubble from yeah. that building. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's a really prominent corner in town here in Moab. So anyone listening in um, that is in, the, in Moab probably sees it a lot. I've had a lot of people in town be like, oh, I drive past you guys like every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool to see their houses be built. Um, and so the first, it's, a, it's four homes. The first two have, were completed and just began their performance period in September. And the second two are slated um, to be complete this winter, hopefully early December for move in. Um, and they'll start a per, kind of a performance period around then. Um, again, we've had a really cool relationship with ILFI. Um, part of this program is that they look for a lot of feedback on um, the certification and LBC and they, they want you to succeed. And we're in affordable housing pro pilot program. So they're like, is this okay? Yeah. Like, are you, are you guys doing all right? Um, and so I think we've gotten a, a lot of support from them and it's been cool to see our feedback incorporated. Um, the little image on this slide is a case study that they published about us, which it was really neat for me to see. I, yeah. I was pretty excited. Um, but yeah, it, it has been super challenging. Yeah, it's, it's been challenging and we've learned. Kate, are there any on. questions that you see? We don't see the little comment. Um, so somebody had a question a little while ago asking what kind of rainwater collection or what kind of water collection you all are using. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's just rainwater. Um, there's two big old cisterns on each house. One um, is inside and is used for toilet flushing. It's inside so that it doesn't freeze in the winter. Um, and then the other is outside for irrigation. So these homes have uh, the inside of their house um, and then they have a, what we kind of call the utility room that has mm -hmm. an outdoor um, a door to the outside. It doesn't actually connect to the inside of the house. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where the composter lives. You'll kind of see it. You'll see a picture of it on one of the slides. But it's where the composter lives and the indoor tank so that it doesn't freeze and they can flush their toilet all winter. Um, and then we have an outdoor tank uh, that so basically we're doing half the roof into one tank and half the roof into the other tank um, <clears throat> with the, the goal of that outdoor tank providing irrigation water for establishing their plants and, and then having gardens mm -hmm. um, later on. So, yeah. And uh, Moab gets what, nine inches of rainwater per year? Average so of nine inches a year, yeah. Very infrequent rain. Yeah. Um, and then someone else asks, can you build anything legally from trash blocks? That I think, <laughs> um, Probably not. not, not a permitted <laughs> structure, but we're using it for like a, basically a fence but like sturdier so Basic, that sound yeah. and stuff. Um, so if you've ever seen like uh, earth bag, uh, I guess, yeah, it's a fence, an earth bag fence or wall. Um, we've done some straw bale walls uh, mm -hmm. in town. Um, so rather than incorporating those materials where we've made these blocks um, mm -hmm. and you basically encase them in the plasters um, and, and they're not gonna be tall there. It's gonna be, probably four feet because I think that's what we can legally do on <laughs> <Right>. the corner. <laughs> and it, it's kind of evolved from like the, the blocks that Kate was talking about making mm -hmm. to like um, kind of stuffing other objects. So actually like the, the big um, 
cans that linseed oil comes in is really is a really great material to have like stuffed right. and then is kind of a strong base to be we learned a lot from <laughs> making trash blocks believe it or yeah. not and found that it's actually maybe easier to like create the form and then yeah. stuff the form well like stuff site. pallets yeah. yeah that's that's kind of a nice they're a good size already <laughs> and they're heavy the other thing is like most of this is like plastic packaging mm -hmm. um they just I I try and take a lot of our packaging just for like personal use. Wrapping gifts. I'm like I'm trying to ship ceramics. <laughs> I got to protect this. It's nice to have this abundance of packaging. Yeah. Anyways, but there's like with things like blown cellulose, it comes in all of these bags, and yeah. um, so so these um, trash blocks and things end up really light, which is kind of difficult. And that's another reason to find something like pallets or um, maybe use like a gabion with like rocks and have some trash mm -hmm. in there. Yeah, we even, we got creative in the office too with like, we obviously as an office have recycled paper and um, I wish we had a larger shredder, but we have mm -hmm. the shredder that we have that can do two pages at a time and we shred <laughs> that and then we use that in our plasters. And yeah. so like we use, reuse that paper again in our plasters, which is great. Yeah. So you don't even make enough of it. I, I know we don't make enough of it. And get more. But it's because people don't like to sit there and shred things. I'll <laughs> do it. I would time. just be like. You know, but they don't, they wait until it piles up and then it looks daunting. You yeah, just got to do it immediately. That's true. <laughs> Henry says that he has a animation of the water system to share. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we can pass it over to Kenner for a moment. Yeah. yeah. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, Kenner, feel free. Yeah, yeah. you bet. My, I'm Kenner Kingston. I'm the architect that helped CR move their standard um, uh, amazing standard, right? Amazing um, straw bale product into the LBC realm, and so we've we've got a couple of graphics I could share with you on the on the waterfront. Where you know we're architects, we do graphics. So um, <laughs> this is a water balance diagram that shows um, the the consumption rates of the different systems in the building and a cutaway of the roof, but really. You know, which is all interesting and good stuff. Uh, it shows you kind of how the how the flow works. But the better way to demonstrate it is with this video. Let me actually um, turn on these two options so that we'll share better. All right, are you seeing my screen? It's, it's all black, but you're yep. seeing my screen. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> You're welcome. Happy to share it. I should say not everything in there is exactly as installed. That was as designed. They were able to make some improvements and adjustments through construction. Awesome. Sorry, I just muted you guys. Okay. <laughs> oh, it said you were trying to unmute us. Yeah. All right, we have a few more slides um, with some of the pictures of <clears throat> our process and some of the larger challenges um, that we had um, since we talked about some of them, but not our largest. So. <laughs> oh, loading. Okay. Are we sh we're shared? Okay, yeah. cool. Um, sweet, yeah, so so the water pedal, which thank you so much, Kenner, for sharing that video. I wanted to include it, and I and I kind of waffled a little, but it is super helpful in explaining the systems, but I was waffling on it just because everything has changed a lot. Um, but it's it's been really interesting. It's been a hard adjustment and definitely one of the more costly aspects of the project. Um, this is, these are the composting units. Um, <laughs> so it can fit roughly three people. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is before they were installed. And I was like, oh, they're here. Um, and then the other picture is uh, just with Glenn, who is the designer and builder of these units. Um, so you can see it's taller than he is. They're, mm -hmm. they're pretty big and um, they're, really cool and um the homeowners seem pretty happy with them so far they're very user friendly yeah um, very user -friendly. seems to be and uh um you know in terms of the the process it's not you know they go out weekly and they turn the time mm -hmm. um uh, to make sure that they're kind of stirring the compost um and breaking stuff as well and um, but th it's not like they have to be in the compost uh, box often. It's mm -hmm. just all externally turning it and everything. Yeah. Um, but so that's the utility room we were talking about. Um, and so there's now there's to the um, left side uh, of Glenn in this photo um, would be where we have our other tanks mm -hmm. um, for the water storage. Um, but yeah, this is, I guess, in terms of, and we were talking about it earlier, they're not really hurdles, they're just larger, they're challenges, and, and more so for us. Yeah, they're um, really more points of growth, but I yeah. was having a hard time <laughs> summing that up. And, <laughs> um, and you know, our, we, we love that we got to do these experimental toilets and kind of hopefully move that process forward in the state of Utah. Arizona mm -hmm. has been using these for 30 years. Um, they use yeah, them in the Grand Canyon. Um, Glenn's actually down in Havasupai all the time mm -hmm. installing new toilets. Um, and you know, those he's doing that are completely dry. There's no water involved whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, but because we were going to have toilets, um, and the homeowner would be flushing, these do involve water. Um, so, you know, these aren't new. They're definitely, they've been improved yeah. upon and, and He's made all the tweaks he feels he should be making and get them functioning the way he wants them to. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> it's been really cool learning about these and, and seeing how they work. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason we went this way, there's kind of a twofold benefit. One being um, that they use very little water, like ideally a composting toilet wouldn't have any water um, going in. And um, for these, we have a vacuum flush toilet that is flushing with just a pint of water. Mm -hmm. um, so super efficient that really um, benefits us with our rainwater collection. Okay, just let us know if we can't see the comment section. So if someone does comment, let us know and we'll answer. But you can only see it when we're not in the full presentation mode. Yeah, I'll definitely let you know. Somebody <laughs> says it's amazing. So cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the other aspects of like in that video that the video showed, um, other aspects of our water system included um, the kitchen gray water being filtered and sent out. Um, that was requiring almost 
it was requiring a lot of maintenance. Um, it wasn't working as effectively. Started um, to smell. It was smelling, and it was just one of those things where we were like, "Well, 4.0 is changing," um, and they're you know making these allowances for affordable housing teams like ours, and um, it really seems like the smart way to go, especially when we like it's not Jess and I maintaining these; it's our homeowners that so kindly and enthusiastically agreed to do this try this out with us um so those the kitchen systems have been um taken out but it that was also like a bit a really big um a point of advocacy for us and mm -hmm. a big step in the save you talk is those um permits were experimental and i think our health department was almost more like if on that then um the composting toilets um, so and there there are states where kitchen water is considered gray water it's not black water um but it is in the state of utah considered black water um so typically the only thing that would be allowed to go to gray water is your shower your bathroom sink your laundry machine mm -hmm. Um, and then your dishwasher and sink, uh, kitchen sink would go to the sewer. Mm -hmm. Um, so as Reed said, we had the experimental permit, um, and the system we tried just didn't end up working. Um, we are looking to see if there's something else that right. could work. Yeah. Um, but for right now we, we took the system out cause it just wasn't functioning very well for the homeowners. Mm -hmm. So. We have somebody asking, um, are there kinds of cleaning products you have to avoid to use gray water? There are. Yeah, gray water and the composting toilet um, as well. But in, in general, um, you know, a lot of, you'll see it on the, the grocery store shelves, the more eco-friendly, um, like laundry detergents. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you can filter like so if you know your gray water is going out you can it, a lot of it does will kind of get processed and filtered through the gravel or wood chips and stuff and then mm -hmm. goes you don't plant your trees or your plants right in the center of the mulch basin because it's going to be a little like basically kind of marshy uh -huh. in there um so you kind of plant them up so that their roots will go towards that but mm -hmm. they won't be directly in it and you won't get root rot and stuff like that but um, yeah, you do have to be cautious of the cleaners you use. Um, apparently, uh, what is that? Green, green, um, simple green, simple green, um, <laughs> is like totally fine to use with a composter and you can flush the toilet and, um, cause the composter actually have worms in them to yeah. help kind of the whole process happen. Um, and so, you know, I was all like, oh God, what? what can they clean the toilets with so they don't kill the worms? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't want the worms to die. <laughs> and, um, and he was like, oh, simple green's fine. And right. it's like, okay. But like in terms of bleach or, you know, yeah. things like that, they would not be able to use. Yeah. And we, I wish I had like, I can't remember that whole list, but we did um, mm -hmm. provide a list to our homeowners of like specific things that are compatible with both the gray water system and the composting toilet. Um, and like we said through this process we've learned a lot about gray water and we one of the projects we're working on now is publishing resources on how to make these brain strain systems and um, what plants are compatible to be in them because you can have you can have some edible plants but you can't have like leafy greens or herbs or anything right. but you can have fruit trees um viney like you could do like grapes like it's things right. that have um yeah, it's not going to be your basil and your tomatoes uh, or your, your herbs. It's going to be yeah. um, <clears throat> your fruit trees, mm -hmm. your kind of more bush shrub type right. uh, fruits. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely, um, I'm sure there's a lot of permaculture sites that talk about it too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there's only specific things you can kind of grow within those um those mediums yeah so one day we'll publish hopefully sooner rather than later we'll publish resources on cleaners and plants and things that are more compatible with uh gray water systems um 
and I, I think the last thing I wanted to say about the water management um, point of growth slash challenge um, is the whole desert environment thing and being like, how do we have urban agriculture and how do we do uh, how do we do these things with um, when we can't require when water. we can only use um, <clears throat> rainwater and so far it's working out well. I mean, we're summer. We we decided to kind of we finished the houses in the first phase in May mm -hmm. and uh, the homeowners had planted and we're getting these trees established and we didn't want to start their certification period immediately because if you live in the desert or you live in Moab, you know that June, July, August are just brutal on mm -hmm. any plant, <laughs> any human, yeah. but any plant and they're trying to establish, they need water. Um, and so we actually, kind of pushed off our certification period uh, start time um, so that we could allow them to use, to get those plants established and not have that like, oh God, I'm using too much water mm -hmm. scenario. Um, so we didn't start till September. September yeah. 1st, yeah. <coughs> but their cisterns still look pretty full and we haven't had rain since it started. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was one big rain, but we, you're allowed to fill your cisterns at the beginning of certification. And so we'd filled them up and then the next day it just like poured and it was like, well. I did that the other time too. <laughs> yeah. It's like, thank you for raining when we've just filled when the tank. we just filled it. So. Um, cool. So the next um, hurdle has been material vetting and sourcing. Um, I mean, material vetting comes with its own challenges of just being able to talk to manufacturers. It's so much work. Um, but then there's this other factor of being in a rural place with a very limited budget um, and making that work with red list vetting. Um, there were a lot of things we got pretty lucky with, like um, our windows. They're really expensive, but they were made close by. And we were like, this is worth it vetting windows is really hard. These windows have a declare label. A declare label um, is another ILFI program that um, basically is a nutrition label for materials. And so a lot of companies will publish um, their material through the declare label that'll say like, oh, this is red list free. Oh, this is what's in it. And um, be fully transparent on what is in there. So there were windows made in Denver <laughs> that had a declare label. And um, so that was super awesome, but it did, um, it was pretty, it was more expensive. And so we were seeing parts of our budget go towards different things than they normally would, which I totally um, think is worth it. Yeah, and windows are definitely an important, I mean, it's one of your biggest leak points in mm -hmm. a home, windows and doors. So going with a nicer, better brand was, something we were totally fine with because yeah. it just meant they were going to have a better sealed house anyways. Right. Um, we uh, definitely found, I don't know, it's been, now that we're in phase two, we haven't had to struggle on the whole vetting and sourcing of materials because our houses are so similar mm -hmm. and we just use a lot of the same products. Um, but man, that first go around was, it was just like every day there was another problem and another like, oh gosh, well, they can't supply it. So now we have to try finding it here. And, and that came from, you know, like there was just a uh, quantity issue. So right. like we found out that a product we needed was manufactured in Salt Lake. And we were like, great, it's, it's in our bubble. Let's go get it. It's like right here. It's, you know, not far at all. And then nobody could sell it to us because we didn't need enough. Like yeah. we, we were having to get like thousands of feet and we needed 200 feet. Right. And so we were like, no, <laughs> like we just want, does anybody have a cutoff? Like yeah. we were like asking them like, well, who do you sell to? And who could we call to see if they just have a piece laying around? Right. And um, you know, so that was really frustrating. I would just, that was like our summer was just like, come on, where like, where is her? this product? Um, and ILFI or LBC does have a whole, like, you know, you don't have to buy something in a large quantity 
if you only need a small amount mm -hmm. kind of thing. But it was also just frustrating because it's like the product was right there. That's all you needed. And, you know, the manufacturers can't sell it to you. You have to go you through to go one through of their distributor. distributors. And so, you know, that was also frustrating because you're like, well, we're Utah based. You're Utah based. Can't you just give us some? Um, yeah. Yeah. That was hard. And that was multiple products. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Same thing happened. Uh, the middle image there is of rock wool insulation. It was basically our, the thing we were most excited about with materials. We were like, well, no more no more oh, foam mom. no we don't want to have foam in our buildings it has such a huge carbon footprint um and so we were super excited to use um this mineral wool product to insulate our foundations um we got it for phase one it actually was very difficult to source as well because of that same thing where we needed some amount and the distributors were like if i provide this for you i have to buy a i have semi -load. to buy a semi-load and you guys want one pallet and i can't <laughs> they couldn't justify that so we've ended up finding someone that could but then on phase two nothing they couldn't sell it to us no one could and it it was just so disappointing where it was like this was the thing <laughs> rock wool mineral wool yeah. was the one thing um so now we need just storage unit so that we can get yeah. a semi load of rock wool and just use it on all of our houses right. <laughs> um another thing with the sort the vetting and sourcing like i said earlier is that we had to order a lot of stuff and that produces more waste instead of being able to pick it up you're getting it online and it's boxes and you so you have all these boxes um we have a picture of one of our interns sitting on all the, the blown cellulose and that is a um huge it has so much waste They're, all those little bags there is so much of it um and the blown cellulose was another interesting one where um, that company was one that we liked. They were in Denver, they were super groovy, but they were really small and so they couldn't afford VOC testing. And so we had to use kind of a series of exceptions to be like, we, we're pretty sure this is gonna be fine. We're sure this is fine for um, indoor air quality. Um, however, like we have to use an exception for it um because, the because they can't there. the testing isn't there yeah. because they're a small company that isn't that can't do that they don't have the resources for it mm -hmm. but we still want to support them right um and then finally that last picture is um some interns doing a waddle and daub wall and so there is just so many cool outlets for when like budgets tight on windows all right we're gonna get really creative and do all these different um less drywall yeah uh, less drywall more reuse of the wood so that was the waddle and dab wall but a lot of the walls they did kind of a uh original standard like plaster technique where yeah. they did the uh laugh mm -hmm. so they used a bunch of um cut unusable yeah. cutoffs and ripped those down and stapled those to the interior framing and then just plastered over that so yeah. it was we pretty much eliminated drywall in those two houses. I mean, ceiling. And ceiling, yeah. um, we had a, a few walls. Sheer, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, it, it, these houses had some really cool um, uses of just other alternative materials to create a base for our plaster. Um, and that, yeah, I really love seeing that. Um, unfortunately, phase two, we've our timeline has been so tight because um COVID happened we had to send our interns home we had less labor it was just four of us going from foundation to stacking straw and so um in in these houses we're using a lot more drywall which is fine because it was vetted but it was definitely cool to have um the time and energy to be doing things like waddle and daub which is very very time intensive yeah yeah um and this kind of leads into the next hurdle oh, there's a lot. um of waste management um which we talked a lot about a question just before you move on oh, um, sure, asking yeah. what your working budget was for a single house <laughs> um so typically uh we work within uh <clears throat> usda rural development um that's who funds our projects our mm -hmm. homeowners have to qualify um for these pro uh for these loans um 
And so uh, they, you know, it depends on the, the area loan limit at the time. Um, and a lot of factors go into it, but um, what was it? It was 250. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's what I was gonna say. So it was like a, uh, all, a, around 250, but that is land included, and there's and a lot of there's site work. There a lot of a site lot work. Of, yeah. So it's not just the house itself um, that that goes into that loan, um, and then community rebuilds as uh, the previous owners of this property, um, and the fact that we were um doing this project and uh basically uh wanted to do lbc and um you know these homeowners were excited about it but it's not something that they had probably ever heard of until they talked to us mm -hmm. um and so we offset a lot of that in the land price um because we were the ones selling the land to them and we wanted to uh make sure that it was kind of yeah wasn't going to be totally supported on them. This is something we wanted to do and we right. wanted to pursue it. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. I normally the material construction budget for a CR house is under a hundred grand. It's normally you're at like between 90 and a hundred. And then these, I think if I, if I'm doing my like mental math correctly of like taking out land and a lot of the like, site work and subdivision and having engineers and architects involved is more like 140, 120 or 140. So yeah, yeah a, a good increase for the, the amount of money that we work with. Right. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it doesn't seem like that big of a number, but. To yeah. our affordable yeah. project, yeah. it is a big number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that's why we knew we were able to try to accomplish it, that, that this, that that land was the land that we could do it on mm -hmm. because we as an organization owned it and we could offset those higher costs that we knew might come out of this project um, with the land. Yeah. Um, we would have never been able to do this on a standard project mm -hmm. um, of having to buy the land uh, at, market value uh, yeah. full price and then also build yeah so someone asks uh how much land also how much land the, yeah how much land is in the because there's the subdivision of four houses or right. houses. The, the whole project is half an acre so each house is it's a yeah two, there's two single family there's two like single homes and then two units that are attached to one another and so those houses have a little bit smaller um, mm -hmm. um, yards basically but the, the entire project is a half, a half acre. acre. Any other questions? Okay cool. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about because I'm so proud <laughs> is uh, the waste management um, which was definitely a challenge it's so hard working on a site where you're like we can't get rid of these cutoffs all the like little pieces of wood it, it piles up and we do like find uses for it in the end but it, it's just a different type of construction site where you you can't throw things away um, and we normally are very efficient with our waste um, anyways. Like there's normally like half of a dumpster per house right. or something. Which is highly unusual for the construction industry. Right. Um, so um, yeah, we got super creative. A lot of the studs are kind of um, stuffed with not necessarily trash, but things that provide a lot of sound insulation actually. Um, so that was kind of a cool one where we're like, this, this is helpful, yeah. like on multiple levels. It's very, very permaculture finding like combined solutions. Um, doing lath, um, that bottom left hand corner is a, a image of um, one of our interns putting up lath, which was made from plywood cutoffs. Um, and this is a traditional way of doing plaster, um, plaster work. I'm a big fan of it. And when we were taught, I remember there being a conversation where it was like, we were asking 
um, our qualifying contractor, like, oh, is it okay? To, like, like, how do you feel about lath and plaster instead of plastering over drywall? And he's like, the only times I don't see a crack is <laughs> when it's on top of lath. <laughs> um, so that was definitely a good, uh, a cool solution to see. Um, and then that middle image, you have um, some mass walls. So typically to kind of help with our um, energy usage, we'll have walls with a lot of mass to them. These are stuffed um, with sort of a cob or a clay straw earth um, combination. And these are pallets. So we're and reusing. These are pallets. Yeah. So we were using a lot of materials. I think there was a lot of like little wood chunks and little things mixed in there that are also providing um, mass, but were something that we were like, oh, we got to find something to do with these. Um, and so, yeah, a lot, a lot of creative solutions within the house um, when it came to like building the houses. And then this site has a lot of kind of different levels to it, as small as it is where we needed retaining walls. Um, and so that's where we we're saying having a demolition before this was super helpful because we had all these rocks and all these cinder blocks and a lot of um, really nice salvaged lumber um, to be able to use. Uh, so. So that is just an image of um, a retaining wall that was built between two houses. There's a lot of other retaining walls that have to happen um, where we'll use, take advantage of um, some of the other um, materials that we have from, um, that would otherwise go to the landfill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the old, the old house, uh, we didn't tear down a structure that was all that great um we had a leaking roof and it was a temporary structure like it was built it was on built cinder, on cinder, cinder blocks. blocks so uh we didn't feel too horrible about removing good things from it because mm -hmm. it was definitely slightly falling apart in its last few years yeah. of life um it was built in the 30s i think um yeah. had many lives in between that but it had a, the stone facade which is where all of our kind of rocks came from to do that wall and mm -hmm. Uh, as Reed said, there was so much uh, true two by four, true one by material, the, like the whole roof was sheeted in true one by. Yeah. It was great. It was a great source of lumber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll right now as we kind of yeah. go into some more question and answers. Really? Um, yeah. So yeah. thanks everybody for. Um, and do you, or will you unmute them so it's not. Are you um, able to yeah, uh, I can, I can have, let me see if I can um, unmute. I can ask all to unmute or we can just have people type into the chat box too. Yeah. 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 Um, so if you would take this poll, I'd really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, and we have two questions so far right now. One is are, what kind of tax credits are available on these homes? Um, I'm guessing there's probably some solar tax credits in Utah. There's definitely solar tax credits in Utah. Um, otherwise, I don't. Yeah, uh, right now, too, we're looking into um, there's tax, not tax credits, there's credits you can get on the types of uh, hot water systems you use or mm -hmm. heating and cooling systems you use through Rocky Mountain Power. Uh, it's the Rocky Mountain Power Incentive. So um, whether you have a home that you're redoing, if you take out an old inefficient hot water heater and you put in a, a hybrid um, or some other more high efficient water heater, they're offering some pretty awesome uh, credits right now. Um, and then it's the same for new building. If you're using certain materials, um, they will supply a, a credit. Um, so that and the solar, I think are probably the, the, the two main credit um systems that the homeowners could take advantage of mm -hmm. and then we have another question um where did you look for materials to salvage Ooh, everywhere all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a demolition that we salvaged a lot of like doors tubs just like raw materials from um a lot of homeowners had luck in the salt lake city area this mm -hmm. time around one of our homeowners um was like in park city for a day and got that some of so the nicest things. stuff i've ever seen so a lot of it's kind of interesting being kind of near so many resort towns where those 
like Aspen and Park City and all these places, people are just remodeling things like newer, new enough buildings. They don't like the color of the granite, so they want to get a different color. Yeah. And so then there's these granite slabs. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was also the school demolition, the, yeah. Um, yeah, the school cool. tech building. Um, I'm actually uh, zooming from a desk that I salvaged from that, that <laughs> building. <laughs> it's a really yeah. beautiful desk, but yeah, all of the cabinets in Brian's home. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. There so was... the local middle school was being torn down and, and that's what Kate's talking about is, um, you know, just kind of putting feelers out. We put flyers and everything out into the community mm -hmm. and we're like, hey, we need light fixtures. We need cabinets. We need sinks. And, and you know, people saw it and let us know like, hey, yeah. the middle school and, um, you know, I have these products and right. um, there's the classifieds that our homeowners find a lot of things on that are local. And then mm -hmm. there's the more broad, like Utah KSL. Yeah, I think. Um, but yeah, it's been a cool process where we've definitely become a receptacle, a, a place where people can drop off mm -hmm. a lot of their salvage materials. And luckily, the like thrift store that is next to our campus stopped taking building materials. And so we were like, hey, uh, we'll we can take your like sinks and light fixtures and. Yeah. Um, it's kind of started this whole other wing of our program, it feels like, where we have all these pretty cool doors and um, sinks and all sorts of other fixtures. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Um, are there any things that you found would, would be like an easy switch for somebody to make if you have been using this material that's on the red list or that's like pretty bad? Um, is there, was there anything that you were like, oh, we should have been doing this all along. It's, it's easy to make this switch. I think one of the easiest switches, it might not be materialized, but it, uh, rainwater tanks, mm -hmm. um, just given the nine inches on average a year here. I mean, we just get, sometimes we get monsoons, <laughs> and, but when we do it just, it's so much water at once. And if we had a way to collect that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used to, I lived abroad in Australia and almost every house, it was mainly in the outback and almost every, every house had huge, they didn't have a limit. Like they had huge cisterns and they were just right next to the houses and nobody cared what they looked like. It was just like, we need water and this is how we survive out here. And this is how we live out here. And, um, I think if we, as a desert community could, be involved in that a little bit more and, and didn't water so much with potable and mm -hmm. kind of helped save and, and um, be more resourceful on that source. Um, it would really help, uh, you know, Ken's Lake might not look like a, a pond now, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Like it could really help if, if everybody had those um, systems in, in place. Um, that would be like one of the biggest things. Yeah. I think in terms of materials, um, I, I'm not thinking of anything that was like new to CR, Community Rebuild specifically, um, but I do think like we'd already made the switch from PVC to ABS, like our, mm -hmm. our plumbers became comfortable with that a long time ago. Um, there's things like blown cellulose, which is such a good um, insulator that's a recycled material instead of um, fiberglass or something in situations where we can't use straw. Mm -hmm. um, but other, otherwise, I don't know that there is any like aha moments with yeah. I think specific materials. I think definitely the ABS and like Reed said, our our plumbers had already made that switch a long time ago. With we we never asked; they just use it. Mm -hmm. um, and using the ABS over PVC is a huge one. Just um, just from the chemical standpoint mm -hmm. of you know when you hear about places like Paradise. California burning down and how toxic it is that's mm. it's coming from building materials and what those homes were made out of mm -hmm. and that people can't move back or start building because the soil and the quality of air is just horrible mm. and that comes from the PVCs that comes from all the um, stains and everything we put into our homes and that's just why would you want to live in that mm -hmm. yeah well, I'm not seeing any more questions. We can leave a couple 
minute or two more to see if anybody else has any questions but you guys have given us a ton of information so we yeah. really appreciate it yeah. i've i mean i built these houses and i still learned some stuff this evening so um <laughs> that was really great especially that uh that little graphic was really great to see <laughs> yeah and i just thank you guys so much for sharing all of this awesome information if you'd like to make a donation to community rebuilds to support the work they do um the link is in the facebook event and i'll also just post a quick link to that in the chat um and there will be a recording of this webinar posted to our youtube channel um the usu extension Mo uh, moab youtube youtube channel <laughs> um so I'll post that in the Facebook event as well for anybody who'd like to um, watch again or take more notes or share with a friend. So well, and thank you everyone for coming out to listen. Yeah. I'm glad there was a decent amount of interest in this, and people were curious. So. Yeah, thanks everyone, and thanks Kenner for sharing that video. Yes. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> if somebody asks, "Can I Google the red list? Will it come up if if they Google it?" Yes. Yeah, there's all all sorts of resources on, um, I think, like living-future.org. Well, and I, don't website. we have um, the Community Rebuilds website? We also have a, a Living Building Challenge page. Mm -hmm. that there could, there's, there's, a link. there's links on yeah. there, too, if, that, if you want to go look into more about the pedals and read more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. I'll leave the chat open just for a little longer so people can copy whatever they want to. Um, but we can end it here. Thank you all.